Uh, the corporate sector purchase program, which I understand it's not a sexy topic, but um, it's actually very relevant for our everyday lives and uh, has uh, a big impact on, on our environment, on our climate, on how we live. Um, uh, so here, um, uh, of course, to give a bit of a background, um, oh, sorry. So, um, as you know, the ECB has been conducting uh, its monetary policy strategy review. The very first one is to, in, was in 2003. The second one started in January 2020. But um, as, as we all know, the pandemic uh, really extended and one would say derailed the process of the strategy review. And the results were published uh, this year, um, in July 8, uh, so the announcements were, were done and we analyzed at length uh, what it meant for, for not only for climate, but um, as you can see for the, the new inflation target that was made symmetric. We have a blog on our website if you're interested what it means. Um, also, uh, inclusion of uh, owner-occupied housing in the inflation index. We also have a blog on this on our website. And uh, now the topic of our discussion today is the action plan to tackle climate change, uh, on which we also have a quick blog. Um, and uh, because it's uh, such a big topic, of course, with um, with the roadmap having many points, uh, we decided to focus on today on the corporate sector pro purchase program only. But uh, just to give you a bit of a background on the asset purchase programs as, um, as colloquially known as the quantity easing, uh, you can understand the unconventional monetary policy um, that ECB has been, or many other central banks around the world has been uh, doing since the uh, global financial crisis, as in huge part the asset purchase programs, i.e. the quantitative easing that you see a lot in newspapers. The refinancing operations in the CB language, it's called the targeted longer term refinancing operations. Uh, basically, it's the way that the banks borrow from the ECB to get money from the ECB. Um, uh, as well as the negative interest policy and the forward guidance. Um, and uh, of course, if you're interested, as Vicky said, we can discuss this at length in other webinars, uh, also explain you. But uh, in terms of the asset purchase programs, it consists of four um, asset purchase programs. Uh, the corporate sector program, which buys uh, corporate bonds. The private sector purchase program is, uh, well, simply known as the government uh, bond purchases. The asset-backed securities purchase program is um, kind of securitized assets and the covered bond purchase program, which uh, of course, if you would like and interested, we could also discuss at length and introduce uh, not, not only kind of how it works, but it, what it means for the environment and what it means for the uh, actual kind of actions in the climate roadmap that the ECB is pursuing. And of course, the pandemic emergency purchase program as we are faced with the huge crisis of Corona and how they start to this unusual kind of uh, purchase program uh, only for the corona times. So why are we talking about the cor corporate uh, sector purchase program is I think there is kind of the most ink has been spilled on this program. And this is, I think, the way, I mean, a lot of climate activists uh, like, um, like us and uh, others um, have been, uh, were really targeting the, the, the corporate uh, sector purchase program because it buys, of course, bonds of uh, very much polluting companies. And it's not a secret, as you can see that uh, client earth sued Belgian National Bank. Um, over uh, high carb uh, corporate, uh, carbon corporate lending policies, as well as um, uh, if you remember in the news uh, or, or not, uh, this year the, the, the Greenpeace landed on a parachute on top of the ECB uh, with a banner saying stop funding climate killers. So you can see that uh, people are very much uh, passionate about, uh, they're aware and they want to change the program. Um, then uh, the asset purchase programs, uh, well, the quantitative easing has been very much growing, as you can see, since 2015. 
uh, more than 3 trillion euros. Um, and uh, of course, the biggest component of it is the government bond purchases, uh, but not, uh, not a negligible amount is uh, the corporate uh, bond purchases. And of course, when we're talking about the ECB, it's easy to kind of say 1 billion or 2 billion or many hundred billions. But um, uh, when we actually talk about the real impact on our economy and our life, it's, uh, it's, it's a huge amount of money. Um, so it is a very relevant program. Um, so just to give a bit of a background, uh, what, uh, what constitutes uh, eligible bonds is uh, there's three criteria. Um, it's uh, issued by corporation in the euro area and it should be in euros. Uh, it should be rated investment grade, um, which is uh, meaning the quality of the bonds and which is obtained by these four uh, external credit rating agencies, um, um, Morningstar, Moody's, Fitch, and Standard & Poor. Uh, and the remaining maturity uh, at the point of purchase between six months and 30 years, which includes many. Um, why we are going into more detail in these three criteria is that you can see that these three criteria is quite lax. It's taking account only the financial risks and it has no line in terms of uh, environmental or, or climate risks. As you can see, there is no condition attached. Uh, the program has been running since June 2016 uh, and until now, of course, with a bit of a pause between December 2018 and October 2019. Um, and uh, as of September 2021, if you go on the ECB website, you can see that the outstanding purchase is around 300 billion uh, euros, which is around 10% of the total asset purchases, as you've seen in the previous graphs. Um, uh, I think uh, one good one thing to, to know that only six uh, national central banks in the euro area conduct CSPP uh, purchases on behalf of the euro system. And this include the banks of Italy, France, Finland, Spain, Germany, and Belgium. And as we've seen in the previous slides, the Belgian National Bank has been go, be coming under uh, quite a bit of heat um, for a good reason. Um, and we can see the, the sector distribution and the country distribution of bonds. Uh, and um, of course, it's, it's no secret that it's in utilities, infrastructure and transportation, technology, um, automotives, uh, especially in Germany. And the biggest uh, countries are Germany and France. Um, I think oh, one thing to, um, to keep in mind is that when you actually go into the ECB uh, website and look at um, into uh, the, the data related to the CSPP, uh, there is uh, no data on the quantity of purchases. So it won't say, oh, we bought how many billion from any or Total or the list, uh, but you will only see this kind of data and how many times it has been purchased. And there is no aggregate data, but um, from the onset of the program until end of uh, last year, uh, we kind of tried to collate the data and we find around 335 corporates um, with uh, around a bit more than 2000 bonds being bought in total. Uh, but as you know, we, we cannot know the exact number of exact volume of purchases in aggregate amounts, which is uh, not disclosed by the ECB. Um, so I think it's not, uh, it's not a secret. And the reason why you're here is that you're very much concerned about the impact of the program on, the, on the climate and environment. And there is uh, a lot of research um, done ever, ever since 2016, uh, 17 uh, on the uh, effect of the program. Uh, so three quarter, uh, two, uh, two thirds of the bonds um, are bought from corporations with uh, high greenhouse gas emissions. This include fossil fuels, transport, and energy intensive uh, utilities. Uh, and it has been, of course, documented at length. Um, as you can see that uh, the, on the left side, uh, there is um, 
it's a paper by, by the researchers uh, that came out in 2017. Um, is that it's uh, concentrated in volumes in manufacturing, electricity, gas, transportation, so very, very energy intensive sectors. Um, why? Uh, so why can it be stopped? And why, um, why ECB continued to buy uh, or still continues to buy bonds from polluting firms is that um, they're guided uh, by something called the market neutrality. And um, I don't know if some, some of you heard, I'm sure you, you did. Um, and um, it's, a, it's basically a principle uh, that is implemented by buying bonds in the same proportion as the market share. So the market share of, uh, of manufacturing utilities uh, is, is this amount of bonds, and then they would buy in proportion to that. Uh, we have a policy uh, brief uh, written by um, Gilvasto and Jordan in 2021 uh, that analyzes market neutrality and comes to a conclusion that it is as long as market neutrality stays, there is no chance that we're going to tackle climate change uh, or the ECB is going to tackle climate change. Uh, it's not a legal principle anywhere. Uh, and uh, actually renouncing market neutrality doesn't mean that it's politicizing ECB's policies or the ECB will be picking and choosing different sectors. Um, and uh, and it even came from the executive board member Schnabel in Isabel Schnabel, uh, it, that she talked about this before and she continues to talk about it, is that uh, should, ECB should develop a new benchmark. So go from market neutrality to market efficiency. Um, and there is uh, quite a bit of research that came out, including a researcher by the ECB, is that ECB is uh, actually subsidizing polluting firms. If you can see the graph on the right hand side, um, you will see that, for example, firms in this kind of greenhouse gas emitting sectors are much more, have a much more tendency to be funded by bonds. Whereas in cleaner services sectors, uh, they access uh, bank loans or they um, issue uh, stocks, equity. Uh, and so just by the virtue of different financing methods, ECB is subsidizing polluting firms. And also it's creating um, kind of systemic risk um, within its balance sheet just because it buys uh, bonds from, from polluting firms, which will be kind of down the line, will, um, will have negative effects on, on, uh, on, the, on the balance sheet. Uh, so uh, as I've alluded to in, before in my slides, um, what happened, what was, so I'm um, now I'm talking about what was uh, happening in the CSPP before the strategy review is that there was a bit of talk on, on kind of renouncing market neutrality and that it needed to price risk correctly, et cetera, very much focused on risk. Um, and, but there is no tangible action was taken in order to change the system, the, the purchase program at all. Uh, and uh, we, we, we looked at the CSPP corporates and uh, if you remember the three criteria, if we, if we only add the fourth one saying, okay, environmental and climate risks needed to be, have been disclosed by the CSPP, uh, we find that only half of the corporates would have been eligible to the, uh, to the program. And this we do by matching the, the carbon disclosure project uh, with the CSPP data. So what the, what the carbon disclosure project is, is that it's a collection, it kind of collects um, corporates in, uh, it, it has around uh, 6 million or so corporates and uh, corporates businesses, uh, SMEs, um, uh, where the investor asks, uh, asks the CDP uh, to, to ask, to do the kind of analysis of uh, climate and um, it, whether the company discloses uh, and what are the risks uh, involved um, in investing in this company. So uh, that's, uh, 
Uh, so now we come to, I guess, the more relevant part that we're waiting for is the ECB climate roadmap. And um, of course, it has many points and we cannot go through them at all uh, this time. And we'll be happy to go through them next time if you're interested. It's, uh, but we're must, mostly be focusing on the CSPP program inside of the asset purchase and collateral framework. Uh, rather than going into more details on uh, the risk assessment and the collateral framework uh, and et cetera. So we really focus on the CSPP. Uh, so ECB, by announcing the kind of uh, climate roadmap, they make their commitment to tackling climate change official on paper. So we can, we can look at the paper and we can say, okay, this has been done, this has not been done. So in a way, a list of uh, things that we can keep them accountable for until 2025. Um, and uh, we looked into, into various uh, points in the roadmap. And there are two things that concern, uh, especially the CSPP program. Uh, which is number one, is looking at the market neutrality and trying to come up with uh, other, other benchmarks to, um, to assess uh, their, their program and allocations and um, develop proposals to kind of amend the CSPP framework in line with the climate and environmental considerations and uh, adapt to the CC CSPP framework. So I, I kind of circled in red adopt CSPP framework because it entails um, uh, kind of tangible action that we can keep ECB accountable for. Um, but uh, other than that, and we can talk in another webinar is, um, is uh, the, the roadmap is quite weak on actual actions. Uh, so it's a good thing that we have the roadmap, uh, but it's, uh, it's slow, it's short on actions, and we're going to now dive into why uh, we weren't uh, very happy when it comes to the CSPP program. Uh, so first point is assess uh, potential, basically look at their market neutrality principle. Um, and as I've already mentioned before, uh, market neutrality has been analyzed by many researchers before. Uh, and there is a wealth of existing literature uh, which the ECB can use and build further actions. But just because they're starting kind of now the analysis delays the, the future actions even further. Um, and uh, as, as you say, uh, standing on the, on the shoulder of giants, looking at the academic literature that has been very extensive, especially on the CSPP. Uh, on the alternative benchmarking models, there has been models developed by Skirmacher, for example, with the tilting strategy, and it has been quoted by uh, executive board member Schnabel. And there is already data for large corporates uh, with existing disclosures at an advanced stage, so they can just use it instead of kind of try to create uh, from scratch and then therefore delaying. Um, and uh, if you can, um, if you uh, look at it closely, market neutrality seemed to be still kind of alive until at least 2022. Uh, you, can, you can see, for example, on, uh, on number four, that until 2021, they're going to be kind of analyzing market neutrality and the pros and cons. Uh, and we know that it needs to be kind of abandoned and um, research jump started immediately. Um, and uh, polluting corporate bonds will be purchased at least until end of 2022, which means that for from here until the end of next year, uh, billions will continue to pour into polluting uh, companies uh, and industries. Um, and the other big point, uh, climate risks in the CSPP, so number nine, uh, is that uh, ECB is going to disclose the climate uh, uh, risk of the CSPP. As you can see, until uh, the beginning of 2023, so even more time than 2022, 
Whereas Bank of England and the Dutch National Bank have already published a carbon footprint of their operations. And there is already big academic literature on looking at the carbon footprint of, um, of the program uh, and uh, other ECB op uh, operations. Um, and so this means that the CSPP will not be potentially changed until 2023. 20, uh, and um, I, um, I don't know if you're aware, but there is a new uh, non-financial reporting directive um, that will be available in 2022, uh, which basically asks the big corporates in the euro area to disclose their environmental uh, portfolio. So their, their risks in their, in their portfolio uh, of um, uh, climate and environmental risks in their portfolio. And uh, also why not use uh, external environmental disclosure, as you know, only financial risk counts, but uh, if we can add environmental risk as well, and in this, this kind of four big rating agencies are already doing financial risks, but uh, we need environmental disclosure as well. And uh, over-reliance on, on external credit rating agencies. Um, so where do we stand uh, on our strategy on CSPP has been very clear from the onset, um, is that uh, bar the most polluting uh, corporates from the CSPP, the ones that do not commit to any goals of the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, in fact, the ones that want to or planning to build new coal power plants in the next 10 years. So this should be completely excluded. And this idea is nothing new. Uh, it, this has been actually championed by uh, Reclaim Finance and Greenpeace and others um, very actively. Um, and uh, to abandon market neutrality immediately and work on alternative benchmarks. There is already academic literature on this, so there is no need to wait until 2022. Disclose carbon footprint into, uh, of CSPP and integrate uh, climate and environmental uh, disclosure into purchase. Um, and number four is uh, what we're working on, and we uh, do ask uh, also our supporters to support this, is that start a public consultation on the CSPP. Uh, this is what Bank of England did with their corporate bond purchase scheme. Number five, uh, integrate climate environmental uh, risk assessment along uh, with credit rating. And number six is develop in-house methodologies to assess uh, climate environmental risk. And this is an ongoing research work that we have at the PMU, which uh, looks at, at a more uh, systemic collateral level um, integration of environment and climate risks into kind of euro system collateral assessment framework uh, so without going much into detail the point one two three four and even five can be done now instead of waiting until 2023 and as you know the next strategy review is scheduled in 2025 uh, but i mean with all the natural disasters that happened last summer uh we really have to say that we don't have a single moment to waste. Um, how can you support our work? Um, of course, you are supporting our work by coming to this webinar this late an hour, and we really thank you very much. And uh, uh, if you don't follow us, follow us on social media, uh, share the content with friends and family, of course, donate. <laughs> um, and uh, as our colleague Sarah would do at the end of this presentation, you can vote for more topics that you would like to hear about. And uh, so that we can give a background knowledge explanation, but also our analysis of, uh, of the ongoing um, uh, developments. And I thank you very much.